Okay, so uh, thank you very much for having me here. It's really wonderful to be here with so many young faces here. And I hope with the talk, you know, I can, uh, can convey to you the excitement we have in our research. And maybe it's something you will pick up later in the stage. And quantum mechanics, as was mentioned, is, is sounds bizarre sometimes, but for me, it was one of the most intriguing things I, I could during my studies as a physicist. So let me tell you what we're doing and how we're trying to explore the world of quantum physics in our labs in Munich. And um, so for that, I try to give you an overview, first of all, what we're going to talk about. So I'll give a brief interview doing what we're doing. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about why it's difficult uh, and how we solve this problem and what tools we have available to do that and then also tell you a little bit about the applications this kind of research has. So when you look at materials, you know, we're especially interested today in exciting materials with special properties, for example, that uh, have this phenomena of superconductivity, uh, that are special magnetic properties which we can use for data storage. So we really want to predict what kind of properties a material has. Now, that's actually quite difficult because even though we know the rules by which these electrons or atoms in a material play very precisely, it's very difficult to solve the equations and predict what the collective behavior of those atoms and electrons is going to be. But that, because of course, this would then give us, you know, you'd handle on designing new materials. So uh, what can we do to solve this problem and why is it actually so difficult? So let me explain that to you. Let me imagine, let's take a hard drive uh, that you could have on your computer and there's data stored on your hard drive. Let's say we have the ultimate density in the end of storage where we could store information, zeros and ones, in these little magnets that can point up or down. We call these the spins of the electrons or atoms. So think of them just as magnet pointing up or down. If it points up, then it's a zero. If it points down, then it's a one. And then, of course, your hard disk could be in this state or that state or there's some information stored in it, so the atoms would be in, in, in this kind of configuration corresponding to the zeros and ones on your hard disk. Now, that's a classical system, and we know how to handle that very well. But in quantum, in the quantum world, we describe states of matter that uh, materials can assume by this wave function psi. So physicists like to use this big psi to describe the states that matter can assume. And in contrast to the classical world, the new thing we have in the quantum world, that a system can be simultaneously in different configurations. So in the classical world, you can only be in this configuration or that configuration. But in the quantum world, you can be simultaneously in all of those different configurations. And that gives you tremendous power, tremendous potential. You're going to hear more about that tomorrow in the part on quantum computing. But it also confronts scientists with a tremendous challenge, because now let's imagine you just want to store the state of your system on a computer, and you have n particles. Then it turns out that you have 2 to the n configurations, which is, can be a huge number if n is already pretty small. Yeah? So a huge number of configurations, and you need to store all those uh, numbers here to just write down what the state of the system actually is. You haven't done any calculation yet. You've just actually stored the state of the system. And that means that even with the best supercomputers we have today, we're not able to tackle this problem, because they run out of memory extremely fast. And it's something we probably cannot hope to solve with even more powerful classical supercomputers, because every time we add, we want to simulate, we want to store one particle more in the memory of that computer, we need to double the memory of that computer, uh, which is because of this exponential scaling. And if we would just think about a modest size of a system of only 300 particles, 300 of those spins of those magnets pointing up and down, we would need a memory storage which is larger than the entire number of protons we estimate to be in the entire universe today. So that shows you that that's actually a difficult thing to do. So of course, I should say, physicists have been clever and material scientists in devising approximate solutions to this problem and still to do calculations. And that works well when typically the system only explores a small part of this large configuration space I talked about. But as soon as you're faced with, for example, dynamical evolutions or special kind of materials which this, explore this entire configuration space, which we call in physics the Hilbert space of the system, then you really have a problem dealing with this on these classical computers. So what can we do? Well, we just try to think out of the box and come up with a completely different solution to the problem. And we try to build a quantum system itself which can solve the quantum problem. 
Okay, this, uh, and this we can do since a few years now because we now have fantastic control over individual quantum objects such as uh, single atoms, ions, photons, or you'll hear superconducting circuits uh, tomorrow, which uh, have been um, ultimately controlled at the quantum limit today. And now we can follow up with Richard Feynman's idea and say, well, why not take these fantastically controlled single quantum systems, build an artificial quantum system out of it to study quantum matter and to solve these outstanding problems, for example, for material science. And this is what people are doing in very different platforms, uh, with ions in traps, with atoms, uh, with superconducting circuits, circuits uh, that you'll hear about more also tomorrow. So what are we trying to do? Let me put this in a nutshell uh, for, real mat for materials. Here's a real material. It's really tiny, right? You hardly see it, and that's reality. Typically, you know, the distances between atoms in a real material are on the angstrom scale, uh, 10 to minus 10 meters, uh, really, really small scale, 10 thousandths of a micrometer, and it's really hard to look into these materials. That's why, of course, people are building really good microscopes to, peek, to view into these materials, and that's, for example, why we're building the XFEL in Hamburg, uh, X-ray laser, to look into these systems. Now, we're taking a completely different approach. We're trying to say, well, if it's so hard to look into this really small material, why don't we make it just bigger? Why don't we just scale everything up in this material so now everything is not on the angstrom scale, but everything is 10,000 times bigger, so now you have micrometer distances between the atoms, and now you can actually, at a micrometer scale, you can actually just use conventional optics, a good lens, to look into this material. Uh, the advantage that has is also that the, the processes that happen in this real material, which typically are extremely fast, which happen on the picosecond or femtosecond timescale, are slowed down in this enlarged material, where now everything happens at much slower timescales, so we can actually conveniently observe what's going on in the system. So this works in the end, because in quantum mechanics, the only thing that counts uh, if you want to observe this collective quantum behavior of matter is this uh, ratio of what we call the de Broglie wavelength, which tells us what kind of wave structure these particles have, divided by the distance between the particles. So if we make the distance between the particles 10,000 times larger, then in order to observe the same quantum behavior, we have to make this lambda, this thermal de Broglie wavelength, also a factor of 10,000 larger. How do you make lambda large, this waviness of the atoms, uh, of the electrons? Well, you actually, it turns out, you have to cool down to extremely low temperatures. That was changes, that's what changes lambda. And that's where the catch is. We really have to cool down to few nanokelvin or microkelvin. So that's just a millionth degree of a kelvin above absolute zero. That's a million times uh, colder than outer space to reach these conditions where that is actually met. So that's what we have to achieve, but then we can look at the same behavior that happens in real materials in these artificial quantum systems. And then the challenge, what we do then in the lab, is basically we try to build these model systems, these enlarged materials, we try to run them in the lab, see what they do, and then kind of feedback from this experience we gain on these artificial systems to learn something for real materials, how we can design better real materials with this knowledge. Uh, what's also cool, actually, is that you can not only, you're not only restricted to what materials you can design today, you can let your imagination run a bit wilder and design crazy materials that don't even exist yet in nature, and just look what kind of properties they actually have. Let me skip that. So here are a few ways how to do that uh, with, with uh, atomic systems, atomic platforms. So there's these ion traps I talked about before. Here you can see a string of 50 individual ions. Each of those fluorescent spots is a single ion. That's an atom where you removed one electron stored in an electromagnetic cage, uh, which is shown here. And that's a photo of these ions. And you can address individual ions. You can make them interact with each other by shining laser pulses onto these systems. Another cool system that people are exploring right now is actually atoms trapped in the focus of a laser beam. We call this an optical tweezer. So it's just focusing down a laser beam to very small uh, scales. And that, the focused beam will create a trapping potential in which you can trap atoms. And here's a picture from Antoine Brovet's group where he trapped atoms in three-dimensional structures. You can go onto his website and you can actually see these things rotate, where you see, for example, well, as a French person, he likes to make the Eiffel Tower in three dimensions. So you can look at it out of these atoms placed on these corners uh, of these tweezers. The system we're using to make uh, uh, these structures are 
optical crystals, how we call them, that we generate by interfering light beams. So here's actually a light pattern. That's actually a real experiment. Light pattern created by overlapping five laser beams from different configurations, from different directions. And you can see the beautiful uh, structure that emerges from that. It's not a calculation. It's really just recorded what happens when you interfere those different laser beams, and you look what you get. And you see you get this beautiful complex crystal structure, which is basically defect three. And now we can basically load cold atoms very gently into this potential and trap them and study their behavior in these optical potentials. Now, the advantage of the method is, of course, if you want to synthesize a new material, a new crystal structure, you just have to interfere the laser beams under slightly different angles, and you get a new uh, crystal with this. Uh, with that, you can study, as we'll see, about a few um, thousand particles in these systems and observe them actually also. So uh, actually, if you want to know how this picture was done, I, and you want to actually look at a lot of very nice optics experiments as well, I highly recommend to you to go to Ted Hench's uh, YouTube channel. His name is Superlaser123. So, and uh, so there are beautiful optics experiments there, and also how this was generated. And you know, let, let's make him a one million YouTube subscriber so he gets this YouTube medal out of this. OK, so we don't we trap these atoms. And we create these quantum states of these different configurations that I talked about. Now, what happens if we make a photo of such a system? Again, remember, we have this psi, and the system can be in different configurations at the same time, as we said. And let's imagine I could take a photo of the system. A quantum system reacts very strange when you take these photos. Actually, this wave function, as we say, collapses. So now you basically only end up with one of those configurations randomly, and you cannot predict which one you're going to see, and this is the one you're going to actually see in the photograph of the system. Okay, so this is what we're going to see, but I cannot predict to you a priori which one I'm going to see. So this is one of the things that quantum mechanics can tell us, but quantum mechanics can tell us how probable it is that those different configurations occur in these systems. And that's a very powerful way of observing these systems. And here's actually an image uh, that this really works. So here's uh, this optical crystal formed by interfering those different laser beams on top of each other. And then we shine in light to make the atoms uh, fluoresce. So they light up like small light bulbs. And each individual kind of light bulb here, bright spot here, is indeed an individual atom trapped in this optical crystal in vacuum. OK, so it's just held by the light field in the vacuum chamber in free space, and we're taking photos of them, and we can see each one of them actually with really good signal-to-noise ratio. And we can actually also control them. We can go in with these lasers and also control the states of those atoms and rearrange them in arbitrary positions. And well, again, as physicists, we love this psi. So just as a demonstration object, we showed we could make this psi out of 26 individual atoms placed in this optical crystal of light. We can do this for the experts, actually also spin resolved. So that's really nice for these systems. We really know, you know, thinking of these magnets, I said these atoms are like magnets pointing up and down. I can tell you where the magnet's pointing up, where it's pointing down, where there's a hole, where there are two atoms. And that's really a lot of very, very useful information we need to describe those materials and to characterize them in completely new ways. We also use light to paint potentials, more flexible potentials that we use to trap these atoms. And here you can see a few pictures that we generated by just shining laser light on these so-called digital mirror devices. This is the same thing that's actually in the projector back there that projects my slides onto the screen. It's an array of micro mirrors, small mirrors that you can tip and tilt, turn on and off, and that allows you to project arbitrary light patterns onto the screen, as you see. But for us, this is super useful because it means we can project arbitrary light patterns, trapping potentials onto the atoms, and have very kind of, kind of interesting configurations to study their behavior. For example, you could have two, two of these boxes. Uh, you fill one of the boxes with atoms, and then you connect them by this wire of light. So that's just light there in vacuum. And the atoms will flow through this wire of light from one box into the other box. And that's, of course, like an electron flowing through you know, a, a, a conductor, a small wire. And we can study the behavior of conductance, for example, as a function of different parameters in the system. We can control the interactions between these atoms to a very, very high degree. There are very many different ways of doing that, so I don't want to go into detail that. We can let them collide. We can use molecules 
as in this symposium, so important to have these molecules interact with each other, or we can use very highly excited atoms where an electron has been promoted to a very, very large distance away from the core, where it flies around this core at very large distances, and now two of those so-called Rydberg atoms interact very strongly, or, um, I don't know, Thomas, you're not going to talk about this, I think, are you talking about the cavities? Also, the cavities, we can modify interactions between atoms or molecules, as you'll see uh, then also later in, in Thomas' talk, by placing them between two mirrors, where light bounces back and forth between those two mirrors, and each time it passes one of those atoms or molecules, it interacts with them, and we can have interactions between those particles over a long distance. Now, all of this is done in complete isolation from the environment. All these micro-Kelvin temperatures that I talked about, you might think, well, this must look awfully cold in your system in your, when you go into the lab. You know, you must see freezing uh, things and stuff. You don't at all. Uh, the only thing we need uh, is an extremely good insulation of our system from the environment. That's why we do all these experiments in vacuum chambers. Right? As you know from your windows, that give you kind of a good insulation, or your cup, you know, these cups which have a vacuum insulation. We do the same, we just evacuate the whole system, and then there's basically no thermal contact to the outside world. So we can create micro Kelvin cold clouds in these ultra, whole, ultra high vacuum vessels and they're basically isolated completely from the environment. And that's a very nice setting to work with, actually. Very unique setting. This complex, this is a view how this looks really in the lab in the end, okay, when people do the experiments, our graduate students and master students do the experiments. We have a lot of lasers and optics that we need to control to make these potentials to cool the atoms, which is then guided over here uh, into this system where the actual vacuum chamber is, where we actually do the experiments that I, that I showed you before. Um, in the end, you know, when you've aligned everything, actually, I should say, when, you, when, when sometimes students like you come and visit the lab, I think this is the optic storage room for us. You know, it looks like a storage room for all the optics because there are just thousands of optics elements on there. But each one of those optics elements is really placed in, on purpose, and uh, so it's really needed. And if you just misalign one of those mirrors, the whole experiment doesn't work anymore. Okay? So you really have to be very careful what you're doing, and you have to be a really good student to know how to align these things, how to bring it back to operation if something fails. But once everything is aligned, then basically amounts to programming the system from the computer, running the program you want overnight, for example, and, and then basically picking off the data and analyzing the data in the next day. So what kind of physics can you, can you uh, look at this? I talked already about these, um, these uh, material science problems, which I'll come back to in a second. One other problem you've heard about maybe from the realm of high energy physics is they were so excited of discovering this Higgs particle in high energy physics. Yeah? Turns out actually a very related, also a Higgs type particle, not the same as the Higgs particle in high energy physics, but one that basically obeys the same equations that we described for the high energy one, occurs at extremely low energy scales, at 20 orders of magnitude lower energy scales in these systems, and we could use these artificial quantum materials to study its behavior and to show its existence and settle a 20-year-old debate in physics whether such particles actually exist or not. Another pretty uh, cool thing we could do, and I just give a few highlights of, of, of and f urge you to follow on on this, uh, maybe on your own then, is to create very strange states of matter. Here, in this case, we were able to create these negative absolute temperature states. So maybe you know from uh, your school studies that in uh, physics, actually temperature zero Kelvin is the, supposed to be the absolute lowest temperature we can reach. But then there's something actually uh, we can go below this negative, below this zero Kelvin scale. And we did this for a gas of atoms. And that actually has extremely interesting properties, this gas. It can have anti-friction. It can basically allow you to violate Carnot engine uh, theorem. So it has really unique properties, and actually, it's, that actually led to an important discussion going back to the foundations of statistical physics and thermodynamics, started by uh, Gibbs already in 1902, on what the correct form of entropy we should actually use to derive temperature. 
So um, if you want to learn more about it, there are by now many, many you know, web pages on that explaining this negative temperature experiment. OK, we even made it into Fox News. Maybe that's not a reference you should use, but, but uh, there are other pretty good ones. Actually, a very nice one uh, I like, if you don't know this YouTube channel, is uh, from the colleagues at Nottingham University. They have this channel called 66 Sim 60 Symbols, where they basically discuss complex physics phenomena and uh, they try to explain it in simple terms. And you know, I was really you know, blown away to see that by now, I think more than 800,000 people have watched this video to learn about what negative temperatures are, how we can understand them, what their properties are, actually. All right, let's do a simple experiment with these, just to show you this quantum world. Let's do a simple experiment of these atoms. I call it our quantum horse race, where we try to put the atoms, align them in this lattice, and let's say we just allow them to move in the horizontal direction. In the other direction, we just make the lattice so deep that they just have to stay within their lane, and they can only propagate within their lane. Now, when you, when you start them, when you let them evolve, you know, one strange thing that these uh, quantum horses do is they actually run in both directions. So they run backward and forward simultaneously. And in contrast to what this movie shows you, uh, we never know which one's ahead of the other one. So in a classical world, of course, you can continuously watch what the horse race is doing. In the quantum world, you cannot. Remember, when you observe in the quantum world, you collapse this quantum state. It's not the same thing as before. So really, we only know the outcome of the race at the end where we take a photo of the system. Before, we have no idea which, which one of these atoms is ahead of the other one. And only when we take snapshots, we can actually, in the end, tell which one won the race. And here are pictures of that. So we can just, for example, align atoms along this line. Uh, we can let them run. You can see how they kind of propagate in this uh, diagonal direction. And then, for example, we take a photo after a certain evolution time, and we see, OK, here are the atoms. Uh, here's the fastest one that ran, for example, maybe in the backward direction, the fastest. And quantum mechanics tells us nothing which of those particles is going to win the race. We don't know. But quantum mechanics tells us if we repeat this experiment thousands of times and I average the outcome of those experiments, what the probability of my particles uh, after this race are going to be. And so this red curve that you see here, that's what quantum mechanics actually predicts, only probabilities of outcomes, not how, li how you know, what we're going to observe in a specific outcome of the experiment. But when we actually see, when we do average our experimental data over thousands of those runs, we see actually very good agreement with this agreement, with this prediction from quantum mechanics. Here's an even nicer plot showing the orange curve is the prediction from quantum mechanics. Uh, the bars are our, our experimental data, thousands of shots, thousands of repetitions of this quantum race and then looking how, what the probability distribution is to find an atom at a certain position in that lattice. And we can see we really have really excellent agreement with this evolution according uh, to quantum mechanics. Uh, one kind of more complex thing I just want to mention, which was kind of for us a research highlight this year, is that we can use this to study far more complex behaviors. This was a very simple example. Actually, uh, more complex behavior coming from the phenomena of superconductivity is to understand how actually these spin ups and downs interact with impurities in these systems. And that is believed to be the key solution to understanding the phenomena of uh, high TC superconductivity. So basically, if I want to put this into a cartoon, let me put it into this cartoon here, you have in two dimensions, this antiferromagnet, where you have these spins pointing up and down, these blue and red uh, particles, and then you put a single hole in there. You just remove one atom. And now you want to understand, actually, how does this single impurity move in this uh, so-called antiferromagnetic background of the system? And that turns actually out to be an extremely difficult problem. Uh, so that's something we hope we'll be able to solve with these new quantum machines. It's a problem that some of the greatest minds in theoretical physics uh, have worked on. Uh, here, Charlie Kane, Patrick Lee, and Nick Reed, which studied this Gedanken experiment. You know, you cannot do this experiment in a real solid. Put a single hole into such a antiferromagnetic magnetic environment, but with these systems, we can actually do that. So here's actually what, what we see. This is like this impurity that we place in the lattice that's mobile, and now we can see from these plots how the environment around this impurity is distorted by having the impurity there. And actually, we can see there's actually quite a severe distortion in the 
proximity of this impurity, and this is for us very exciting because it really allows us to get a first microscopic glimpse into what happens when you put these impurities into these special kind of magnets and learn how they modify their vicinity, how they modify their surrounding, how they move completely differently through this antiferromagnet, and uh, that's kind of the first model-independent characterization of such quasi-particles, as we call them in physics, and the first snapshot of individual quasi-particles occurring in these systems. And that's already something we have really trouble calculating, for example, on these supercomputers. So this is really where these systems are offering us answers to problems that we cannot solve today. One final uh, topic I want to talk about before I finish is this thing that connects maybe even more to, to all of us, and that's uh, the clocks, okay? So you say, well, clocks, why is that important? Well, remember, you know, I have my running watch. Each time I turn on my running watch, it connects to a very good clock in space, an atomic clock in space that sends timing signals actually from several satellites of the GPS or GLONASS or um, uh, satellites uh, that send timing signals to my watch so I know my position. I need to receive three of those satellite signals and I can locate my position in space. And so knowing uh, clocks, uh, building better clocks, has immediate uh, implications for navigation. Uh, that has been through humankind always the case, and that's still today the case. So we really want to build better clocks. Okay, so to have better navigation in geodesy, to have also for astronomy better capabilities of synchronizing telescopes across different continents with each other to increase the resolution of those, and maybe also to realize fundamental tests of physics to really see whether our constants, fundamental constants we have in physics, really are constants or whether they're actually drifting over time with a very, very tiny rate. So what is a clock? I don't know if you asked yourself that, maybe not. I mean, it's the thing you have on your arm, right? I mean, it's the thing you look on, but, but what is it actually? Well, for a physicist, the clock is a very simple thing. It's something which has a periodic motion. This could be a pendulum that oscillates back and forth. That doesn't make a clock yet. Then you need also a counter, okay, that counts those oscillations of that periodic thing. And then we can say, okay, let's have this mechanical pendulum, and let's just define the second as uh, five oscillations of this pendulum. That's what we could do. We could say one second is defined as five oscillations of that pendulum. And that's actually what is done. We're just not using mechanical pendula anymore. Those are not good because you can imagine, you know, a mechanical thing, if the temperature changes, the length of the wire is not the same, then this thing will have different frequencies. So we, we, we don't do that. So we actually do that today by atomic clocks. And it turns out that today, actually, the best atomic clocks uh, the best clocks you can build are built by holding those atoms in these optical lattices that I introduced to you before. So what is the pendulum here? The pendulum is actually the electron cloud of an individual atom oscillating back and forth. So we can set this electron cloud into motion so it starts to oscillate. And it oscillates very, very nicely because by keeping the atoms separate from each other, we can avoid them bumping into each other and perturbing this collision. So they can really nicely oscillate back and forth without being perturbed by all the other atoms. So that's why we like these lattices. And it turns out these are fantastic clocks and probably the next generation uh, of definition of the second will be based on such atoms in these, in these clocks. Just to give you an idea, these are clocks that basically if we would have started them at the beginning of the universe, the Big Bang, 50 billion years ago, they would be just off today by one second. Okay? These are clocks that are so good that they can measure also relativistic effects, for example. If you run the clock here, or only a few centimeters below, we know from relativity that should change the rate at which this uh, clock goes. And actually, you can measure that. So you can start, because of this fantastic precision you have with these clocks, you can also look at other fundamental physics effects with them uh, and study them with these. You can use them to map out uh, the geodetic surface of the Earth and many, many more things. So this improved precision that we get here, a seemingly you know, abstract thing, leads to immediate applications to many, many uh, degrees across fields across science. Um, all right, I think I've come to the end of my talk. Go on, I hope I'm in time. And uh, I just want to hope I convinced you that these are exciting you know, objects we're studying. These are exciting 
interesting times to just study these artificial quantum systems for many, many fundamental physics region, reasons. For application reasons also, we hope we can apply these quantum systems, as you'll hear tomorrow, for quantum computing to many other applications. This we'll have to see. But uh, it's certainly very, very exciting to have this at hand and to be able to make use of these new observation techniques. So finally, I want to highlight the people who really did the work. It's like, you know, students like you will become probably, maybe in Chalmers, maybe somewhere else, uh, who do the work uh, uh, with us in the lab, and they did a fantastic work. So the Polaron work I talked about, this was uh, Yanis. This is Yanis' PhD thesis. Uh, Jaya is a senior PhD student, and Dominic and Sarah are the new PhD students, and Mim and Guillaume are postdocs, and the whole team was led by Christian Groß. And the final team, uh, what I want to show you are for the quantum gas microscopes. This is uh, David, new PhD student, uh, Tony, a senior PhD student, June, postdoc, and Simon, also senior PhD student. So with all of those fantastic people, this wouldn't work. This we need. We need fantastic people who are excited about doing these kind of experiments with us uh, in our labs and, um, and enjoying you know, the quantum fun we can have with quantum physics. So with that, I leave you with this nice picture from Munich, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>